after uh, after Wes saying last week that he was going to we we're going to start every morning every Sunday we're going to start dead on half past ten and I've kind of let the side down already so uh, good morning um, I'd like to wish you all a very warm welcome here to Sheep Street um, and it's lovely to see you all a special welcome to um, if you're a visitor and uh, please do stay for refreshments in the hall um, after the service so we can say hello uh, we do ask that uh, masks uh, be worn during the service, and though we can stand and sing, we do ask that masks are worn throughout the, throughout that, the time. Um, sadly, um, illness and other circumstances are continuing to keep our band from playing, um, but I hope they will be back again soon. And it won't stop our enthusiasm for, uh, for singing as we, as we praise God this morning to, to recorded tracks. Uh, we do have a couple of notices which I'm going to uh, going to get out of the way. You may notice that, uh, well if you don't know me you, you won't know, but I'm Ian um, and not Wes. Uh, I'm merely a stand-in for Wes, um, you know, not quite up to his stand I'm afraid, but that's what you've got. Um, and uh, Wes was going to be leading the service this morning, but has decided to um, err on the side of caution and stay at home. He has uh, several members of the family have tested positive for COVID, and although last I heard um, he was negative, he's testing regularly, he doesn't want to put anyone here at risk and has stayed away. So please, please do remember the Porro family in your prayers this week. Um, and I think it's a timely reminder that despite the easing of uh, restrictions, COVID is still very much a threat. Um, there are a number of people this morning who haven't come here today because either they're vulnerable or they care for somebody who's vulnerable. Um, so, yeah, um, do, do think about those in our fellowship and uh, in your prayers this week. Um, we have several members of the medical profession in our fellowship and they will tell you that cases in hospital are, are going up at an alarming rate. Um, and just because you can't, um, just because you've had, had, had a double vaccination, um, you can still be quite ill. Um, there, there are certainly COVID patients in hospital now who have had both jabs. So, but that's not to kind of stress you out, so, so don't... Uh, don't be stressed by that, but do take precautions and take care wherever you are. And of course, as we worship together this morning, um, it's fantastic to see everyone here to, to, to worship together and to join together in fellowship and, and, and for refreshments afterwards. But please, um, let's remember to continue to socially distance um, when we sit down in the hall um, and, and to wear a mask when we're moving about the church. And that's that's for the benefit of those around us as well as for ourselves. Last week, uh, Wes started the service by mentioning rotors, uh, a really dull subject, I'm afraid, but uh, uh, one of those necessities that keep the church running smoothly. And, um, and importantly, you know, kind of they ensure we have things like you know, milk for the tea and, and, uh, and don't run out of chocolate biscuits. I'm sure there's probably more important things than chocolate biscuits and the provision of, uh, of those, but uh, I always put biscuits quite high up, you know, kind of that's quite an important thing. <laughs> um, I, did, I did hear of a church where, as everyone came in, they, they put their hand into a bag and pulled out a piece of paper, and that was their job for the, for, for the morning. And that's kind of, that's quite an exciting thought, isn't it? I quite like that idea, but... Um, I think maybe we should be a little bit more organised than that. Um, and as, as Wes said last week, we're, we're a family here and we all have abilities, we have gifts and skills and something to offer. And there's no single task that's more important than another. So it's just, we're doing God's work and it's good to share responsibilities and to share the load, however large or small. So my basic message is... Don't be backward about coming forward, and if you think you can help, let one of the leadership know, or you know, don't, don't wait to be asked. Have a word with me afterwards if you want to know more. 
As we, as we worship and begin our time of praise and thanksgiving this morning, let's begin, let's begin how we should start most things, with prayer. Almighty God, thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered, you are there with us. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Pam's going to be preaching this morning, continuing our series on Mark's Gospel. Um, this will be part five today. And if you've missed any of the previous uh, services, they're available on our YouTube channel um, or via the church website. So we look forward to hearing Pam a little bit later. But let's start with our first song. Um, Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace.
love the words to that song. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote the reflection for our weekly newsletter. It's something a number of us take turns to do, and um, I try to make it a little bit interesting at least, thoughtful and hopefully of some, some help as we think about our faith and our Christian lives. And the topic I covered was the Reformation, which sounds really dull, um, but actually centres around the fact that we aren't saved by what we do but by God's grace. We're saved by God's grace alone. And sin and forgiveness is something that Pam will touch on a little later, but um, as Christians, we're often held up as a people who've got their act together, um, who are good and righteous. But actually, we're people that know that however good we are, and as Christians, we do try to do what's right, you know, but however good we are, we aren't good enough. We all, every one of us, fall short. Only Jesus lived a perfect and sin-free life. And part of receiving forgiveness is acknowledging the sin in our lives. Uh, John writes to a group of early Christians in 1 John, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us all from righteous, unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This morning, let's, let's acknowledge that sin as we pray together a prayer of confession and a request for forgiveness. So, let's... Uh, find my, my copy. Let's, let's pray the words on the screen together. Merciful God, we confess to you now that we have sinned. We confess the sins that no one knows and the sins that everyone knows. The sins that are a burden to us and the sins that do not bother us because we have got used to them. We confess our sins as a church. We have not loved one another as Christ loved us, and we have not given ourselves in love and service for the world as Christ gave himself for us. Father, forgive us. Send your Holy Spirit to us to give us power to live as, by your mercy, you have called us to live. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's, let's stand and sing at the foot of the cross, after which Pravin will lead us in prayer. See 
Good morning, everyone. Let's bow down our heads and pray. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for your written word which inspires us, showing us who you are, showing us how you love us and how we should live. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us together this morning. I thank you for showing us another day in our life. I thank you for another lovely day for us to live. Dear Father, on this day we pray for our Queen, for our country, for the leaders of our country, whilst they take important decisions, decisions that affect each and every one of us. I ask you for your wisdom, for your guidance on all the leaders when they govern our country. We especially pray for the upcoming COP26 climate meeting and ask for your divine guidance on all the leaders who will be attending these this conference and working towards improving the climate catastrophe that we are facing. We ask you for your guidance on these leaders and ask them to work together and reach a unanimous plan and a unanimous conclusion to save the planet from the climate catastrophe. Faithful God, we pray for all the Christians throughout the world, all, all the Christians who gather within your name, particularly for those who are persecuted because of their faith in you. We ask for your protection for them and strength and guidance to all individuals and organizations that seek to help help them. We pray for our town of devices and our Sheep Street Baptist Church family here, Lord. Bless and guide each and every person in this town and in our family of the Baptist Church here, Lord. Provide your protection, your guidance, and your assistance to us, Lord. We pray for our NHS and the health sector, the health service. As we enter a difficult winter ahead of us, Lord, we pray to keep everyone safe and healthy. We pray for your health. We pray for your guidance as we battle through this pandemic, O oh Lord. Keep us all safe and protect us. Creator God, we thank you. We thank you for the entire world and its people. And we pray for all the countries that are torn apart by the conflict, the illness and the, hang and the hunger around the world, Lord. We ask you to provide, to provide your wisdom, to provide your guidance, to provide your knowledge. We pray for our local community. Show us, Lord, how we can best serve people who are struggling, who are struggling in any way, who are struggling to put food on the table, who are struggling to heat their homes, who will be struggling to heat their homes in this winter long. Provide your help and your guidance, O Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for the children, the teachers, and all the staff in the education sector who are on half term at the moment. 
let them be refreshed by this half term holiday lord we pray for the sick and the grieving lord those who are hurting lord we pray for your precious healing lord guide and protect everyone lord lord we ask you to be with us in the coming week as we venture out on our jobs on our holidays and whatever we do from the week on mon- from monday lord be with us and help us and protect us oh lord i ask your blessings and your mercy on pam lord as she brings her word to us this morning open our hearts and let us accept your word graciously lord as we go out from here now lord be with us and help us and guide us i ask this little prayer in the precious name of our lord and savior christ jesus christ amen well good morning Now, if you were here last week, you will know that we managed to have our first junior church group in the hall. Yes! <clears throat> and it was really good fun. It was really lovely that we were able to get the children, young people together and actually be able to talk to each other. But I'm afraid we can't do it every week just yet. Uh, we're planning on doing it monthly, so we'll have an all-age service once a month and we'll have once a month go out to our groups So provisionally we've I think we're the 14th no 12th what are anyway the second week I think it is in in November we'll be going out again. So third week anyway we'll we'll come back to you on that date. And uh, but for this week as usual I've got you some activities to do you probably already discovered them. And we haven't had the Bible reading yet this morning but I'll give you a bit of a spoiler that it's Mark chapter 2 and it's the story of the four friends who um lower their friend through the roof to Jesus. So, number one activity you have a little house and a slot that you cut out, color it in and you slide it through the back and you will see the man being lowered to meet Jesus. So, there's one for you to do. second one for you to do is a heart and this heart's got broken down the middle but it says Jesus came to heal the sick and broken hearted and to bring forgiveness when we mess up and then I've fixed the heart back together again with some plasters to represent Jesus's healing so there's that for you to do and then finally thinking about that roof that they took apart I always felt a bit sorry for the owner of the house but anyway last week we were thinking about prayer in our group out in the hall and uh, so I thought we could make a prayer roof that using the tiles stick make yourself a tiled roof and write on names of people that you know need some healing or some help or situations where you need God's help So those are three activities for you to do. There's only one on each table. So for you guys, for this three of you, I'll bring some more bits over. Um and if you've run out of anything, there's more on that side table. So come over and help yourselves. So hopefully that will keep you occupied. Now, we're going to sing again. I've been wanting to you have this song in church for a long time. It's Rescuer by the Rend Collective. Now we sing the my lighthouse which is by the rend collective and we sing build your kingdom here now this one is great and it's got a slightly wacky video but i thought we ought to have the slightly wacky video now i don't think the words are on the screen 
So don't worry, enjoy the video, enjoy listening to the words, join in when you can, and if you're really keen, there's a hey and a ho quite often through the song. So you could do your hey and your ho or clap along. Let's just enjoy, probably stand, and enjoy the Wren Collective and uh, Rescuer. Thank you. taken from Mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. Um, it's page 1003 in your church Bibles but the, I think this is good news um, so slightly different. A few days later Jesus went back to Capernaum, Capernaum and the news spread that he was ho at home. So many people came together there was no room left not even out in front of the door. Jesus was preaching the message to them when four men arrived, carrying a paralysed man to Jesus. Because of the crowd, however, they could not get the man to him, so they made a hole in the roof right above the place where Jesus was. 
When they had made an opening, they let the man down, lying on his mat. Seeing how much faith they had, Jesus had said to the paralyzed man, My son, your sins are forgiven. Some teachers of the law who were stand, sitting there thought to themselves, How does he dare talk like this? This is blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. At once Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he said to them, Why do you think such things? Is it easier to say to this paralysed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, pick up your mat and walk? I will prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man... I tell you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. While they all watched, the man got up, picked up his mat, and hurried away. They were all completely amazed and praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. I'm just going to jump in. <laughs> and let's, let's just pray for Pam as she shares God's word with us this morning. Lord, thank you for your word this morning and for Pam who will be leading us and teaching us. Make your word clear to us and give us understanding and knowledge as we hear your message and learn the practical implications as we live our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, it took us about five weeks to get through chapter one. So much action going on, and it hasn't stopped now as we come into chapter two. It doesn't slow down at all. You remember that Jesus had left Capernaum, and he travelled through to Galilee. Many places in Galilee, villages and towns. Now, here he is back again in Capernaum, and he's probably again at Peter's house, if you're worried about the roof, Muriel. The crowds were massing in and around the house, with more people arriving every minute. And among them were these four men carrying a man who was paralysed. We don't quite know how he was, they were carrying him, but I suspect it was on a stretcher, because Moore was giving you pictures of a man on a stretcher, so it must be right, must not it? But I suspect that was. That's why there were four men, one carrying each end of a pole. It can't have been easy to carry him from his home, even if it was nearby. It can't have been easy to get him through that crowd that was so dense. And to manoeuvre him up the stairs to the roof was probably very tricky. Making the hole was probably the least difficult part, but it was a very big hole. Lowering him down into the room, either by dropping him or crushing, there was a risk that he would crush, that he would crush the people below. Now, after all, they were tightly packed in. It was challenging, the whole thing was challenging. But they were thinking outside the box. They weren't just going to give up and go home and leave him as he was. It might also have been costly for them in other ways. They might have lost working hours, and that means they lost income. They might have had to pay for the roof repairs, but they were determined. This man was important to them in some way. We, we don't know how, but he was important to them. And they'd heard about the miracles Jesus was doing, and they believed that he could heal their friend too. The roof of a typical house at that time was flat. It was made of clay laid over wooden beams, and there may well have been rugs and branches laid on top of that. Once on the roof, the four man, men began making a hole, a big hole, big enough to get a man through. Clay, twigs and stuff would have fallen down on the people in the room. Can you imagine how you would have felt if you'd been in a room with chunks of roof falling down on you? Can you imagine how Peter felt if it was his house and the, and the roof was falling in? Can you imagine how you would feel if it was in your home? The house was packed. People were squashed in. And yet somehow this paralysed man was lowered down. Space was made for him. Now, something struck me as I read this very familiar story. Firstly, the man doesn't seem to have said a word through the whole of this time. Maybe he wasn't capable of speaking. Maybe he'd had a massive stroke. We just don't know. Did he know where he was being taken? We don't know that either. Did he know who he was being lowered in front of? Did he feel his situation was hopeless or had a, a glimmer of hope raised up in him when they told him where they were taking him? Did he have any faith at all? We have no idea. We just don't know. 
And we don't know either if any of the men spoke, those four who brought him. And yet Jesus saw their faith by their actions and he responded to their faith. He responded by meeting this man's deepest needs. And this man's deepest needs were that his sins, <coughs> his sins would be forgiven. And only after that did he heal this man's body. Now, I want you to be, make sure that you hear what I say next. Not all sickness is caused by sin. I had pneumonia twice when I was about two years old. Went on to have chest infections most months and asthma for 35 years. I was a naughty child, but I don't think I was that naughty that I was inflicted by those illnesses by my sin. <coughs> Sorry about this. Not all sickness is caused by sin. In fact, the majority probably isn't. But this particular man, in this particular place, was sick because of some sin in his life. And Jesus healed him, all of him, his body and his spirit and his soul. And the man got up and took, his mat, took up his mat and walked out, hopefully with his life changed forever. This true story happened long ago but it still speaks to us today. I want to spend the rest of my time here talking about another true story and seeing the way that God has worked through a particular person, but in a different way. Some of you may have heard of her. Her name is Johnny Erickson. She was aged 17 in the 1960s. She was finishing high school and she had a very promising future career as a professional athlete. She'd already won many, many medals. That summer, she went with friends to swim in a lake and she dived from a platform out in the water. But the water was much shallower than she thought and she hit her head on the bottom. In an instant, her arms and legs were paralysed and she became quadriplegic. She spent months and months in hospital having surgery and extensive treatments. But despite that, she remained a quadriplegic, with just a little movement left in her shoulders and her upper arms. The rest of her body was completely paralysed. Johnny came from a Christian family, and she'd given her life to God at an early age. She prayed hard, as did her family and many friends. She searched the Bible, and many of hundreds of people across, across the USA prayed for her. She came across the story of the paralysed man in Mark 2. And when she went home from hospital, her family and friends took her to dozens and dozens and dozens of healing meetings. She confessed every sin she'd ever committed. She confessed every sin she could think of, even though she didn't know she'd committed them. But nothing changed. Her body remained un unresponsive. And after one healing meeting, her sister was driving her home. And Johnny sat in her chair in the car, fuming. What kind of God was he who would refuse to heal her? A young woman with so much potential. She was so angry, she decided that if she couldn't be healed, she would just lay in bed until she died. So she lay out in bed day after day, refusing to let her carers get her up, refusing to eat. How could God be good at all, and yet let something as terrible as this happen to one of his children? And as she lay in bed, suffocating herself with self-pity and self-loathing, she finally said, I can't live this way. I'm so lost. <coughs> God, please show me how to live. I knew I shouldn't have done that singing. Her thoughts kept coming back to Mark too and the story of the man coming through the roof. And she began to see that God's goal is not to make us comfortable, but to make us more aware of him and his love for us. She began to know a deep peace in her spirit. And then gradually God began to show her that he still had a purpose for his life, her life, a great purpose. Johnny wrote a book about her story in 1976. And I must have read it fairly soon after it came out. 
It had a big impact on me. And that book now has been translated to, into at least 38 other languages and read around the world. And then in 1979, a film was made of her story with her taking her own part. And that too was shown around the world. I remember seeing it in Bristol at the neighbouring church which ran it and lots of us went. And I remember being profoundly impacted by the story again. And then it sort of sank into the background for a long, long time and I'll tell you what happened next later. That same year, 1979, a ministry was set up by Johnny and her friends to address the needs of families affected by disability. And that ministry is still active across the world today. It's a charity called Through the Roof. It's spread across the world and its impact is huge. In 1986, she held disability workshops in Amsterdam where 8,000 Christians across Europe learned about the idea of disability ministry. In 1989, she spoke at the Billy Graham mission to 100,000 people. In 1994, under the banner of Through the Roof, a sub-charity named Wheels for the World was founded to share the gospel and provide help with mobility in developing countries. Also in 1994, the first team went to Ghana to distribute wheelchairs. They worked with local churches and taught God's heart for the disabled. In many churches, it was, it was believed very strongly that all disability was caused by sin, either the sin of the person or the sin of their family. In 2000, she went to China to begin opening doors for Wheels for the World. And then she went on to Australia as chaplain for the 2000 Olympics. None of this would have been possible without her friends. She is physically unable to move. She is permanently in a wheelchair, totally physically dependent on others. <coughs> in 2006, she was appointed to the Disability Advisory Committee at the US State Department. Then in 2010, the restoration workshops began in prisons in America. Bits of wheelchairs, or battered old wheelchairs, not functioning, were sent to the prison and the prisoners restored them as good as new. That now happens in prisons in this country as well. I'm not sure which ones now, but uh, there was one on the Isle of Wight and one in the Midlands somewhere a few years ago. In 2014, Wheels for the World distributed the 100,000th 100, wheelchair in Ghana. In 2017, Johnny celebrated 50 years of God's faithfulness to her in her wheelchair. She's often said she would rather be in that chair with God than on her feet without him. I said earlier that I'd been greatly impacted by her book and the film that was in the 1970s. In 2003, my life changed when my husband died. And soon after that, without consciously looking for it, I began to hear about the work of Wheels for the World again. And in 2004, I made the first of eight trips to Africa, to Ghana, to Kenya, and to Uganda. And when I married the lovely Christopher in 2006, he came with me on some of those trips. He worked as the administrator for the team, and I worked as the pastor. The rest of the team was made up with physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and what we call techies. That's just handy people who can do odd jobs. Sometimes because the people haven't been, had the treatment they would have here, spasticity has set in, and wheelchairs need to be specially padded with foam, all sorts of things were possible. Each trip we made enabled us to bring help to between two and 300 people, plus their families plus their communities. And on each trip, many people, both able-bodied and disabled-bodied, gave their lives to the Lord. On each trip, we spoke in churches and other places, telling about God's heart for the disabled. The trips have continued throughout COVID, but they've adapted as we've all had to adapt. The guiding team here of physios, OTs, techies, and pastors and so on, met a team, a local team in the, in the African country or Indian country um, made up of the same people, physios, OTs, pastor, 
techies, etc. And they met through Zoom. So the work carried on, maybe a bit fewer in number, but it carried on the same. UK prisons still repaired wheelchairs, which were put into containers and sent to the country. A local pastor led the team on the ground. And again, as well as being helped by wheelchairs, walking aids, etc., many people came to the Lord. And all this because of one paralysed woman, able only to move her shoulders and her upper arms a little. Johnny and friends. I'm so glad that I became one of Johnny's friends and were helped to work. Those trips transformed my life as well as the people we ministered to. And if you want to know more about Wills of the Word, do come to me to speak to me or Christopher, Christopher afterwards. And I can put you in touch or I can give you some information, whether for prayer or you might feel stirred to go yourself. That's between you and God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these two stories. One long ago, where you healed a man, body and spirit. And one in more recent days, when you healed a young woman in, in a spectacular ways, even though she's still paralyzed. You have used her mightily. You have given her to us as an example of what you can do, however helpless we may feel. So Lord, again we give ourselves to you and ask you to show us how you want each one of us to serve you, whether in small ways or big ways. We bring ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing one last song, which I think is a little, little easier to sing than the one that uh, <laughs> Muriel Nautily picked for us. It's water you turned into wine. Jesus can do all sorts of miracles. Let's wait for him to do some miracles among us. Eyes of the 
So thank you to Pam and all those taking part this morning. It's been lovely to be with you all. Um, please do stay for refreshments um, in the hall and come through to the hall and take a seat and you'll be, you'll be served. Uh, let's end our service this morning with a blessing. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whoa.